Okay, well, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, event today on democracy, autocracy, and revolution in Russia and post-Soviet Eurasia. This is one of those events that uh, covers everything and brings a brilliant speaker to us to cover all the big events <laughs> around this topic. Uh, I want to just begin uh, by thanking the Strauss Center uh, for sponsoring this event and the Br Bromley program. Uh, as you know, I'm Professor Jeremy Suri, and I have the great uh, fortune of working with so many of our terrific students here at the University of Texas at Austin and through the Strauss Center. And it's my job today, my only job, to introduce uh, one of my students, who's a Brumley Fellow, a very distinguished all-star graduate student, also just a, a delightful person to work with, a person of deep knowledge, but also a gregarious, optimistic, uh, congenial personality, uh, and, and better facial hair than my own also, uh, <laughs> Matthew Orr. Uh, Matt is a third-year graduate student in both the Global Policy Studies program at the LBJ School and in the Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies program at UT. He's doing a dual degree master's. He received his BA in Russian Language and Literature from George Washington University, and our guest is from GW as well, so there's a little GW mafia uh, going on here. Uh, and Matt's interests um, span issues from civic education to democratization and social change in Russia, Ukraine, and the Eurasian space. He focuses on history, literature, social science. Uh, he's worked in Russia for three years, which means he spent three winters in Russia. That was always the test for me as a historian. Could you spend one winter in Russia? I did that. That was enough. Matt is a, is a true Russian, a, a true martyr. He spent three years in that space, uh, three summers, uh, and it, this included teaching English uh, through a Fulbright program. Matt is fluent in Russian and Ukrainian. Uh, he's the co-host of a terrific podcast, Student Run, that I recommend to all of you called Slavic Connection on all things Slavic and even some non-Slavic things. I also know that Matt is a, an expert on Belarus as well. He's been on, on my podcast, This is Democracy, to talk about uh, some of the really important changes happening in Belarus, which don't get enough attention in the United States. And the last thing I'll say about Matt is as part of his MA thesis and also his Bromley project, he's doing some really exciting groundbreaking work on civic education in Russia and Ukraine, comparing and showing how in some ways Ukraine has done a little better in civic education and how that has contributed perhaps to some better democratic outcomes or progress at least in Ukraine. Uh, but without further ado, uh, let me just turn it over to Matt. Matt, thank you for organizing this event and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Suri, for that wonderful introduction. It is my pleasure to introduce our main speaker today, which is Dr. Henry Hale. Uh, Dr. Hale is a professor of political science and international affairs at George Washington University, my alma mater. His publications have won two prizes from the American Political Science Association, and he currently serves as the chair of the editorial board of Demokratizatia, the journal of post-Soviet democratization. Uh, Dr. Hale is also the co-director of the program on new approaches to research and security in Eurasia, Ponars Eurasia. Um, he is the author, among other articles and books, of Patronal Politics, Eurasian Regime Dynamics and Comparative Perspective from 2015, and co-editor of the textbook Developments in Russian Politics 9 from 2019. He has spent expensive time, exp extensive time conducting field research in post-Soviet Eurasia and is currently working on identity politics and political system change with a special focus on how public opinion dynamics in Russia and Ukraine are shaping those countries. I think that the public is well exposed to the opinions of policymakers, former diplomats, officials, and so on, as to why democracy finds itself in such a difficult position in Russia and post-Soviet Eurasia. But I think it's much rarer that we get to hear uh, an academic perspective, maybe, uh, from those who are able to step back and engage these issues in a more scholarly way uh, to help us understand uh, democracy struggles in Russia and the region and maybe what we could do to better support it. Um, and so with, with that, I'd like to thank Dr. Hale for being with us today. I think it'll be a real treat and I'll turn it over uh, to him. Dr. Hale, take it away. Hey, thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Jeremy. And um, more generally, uh, thanks to the Strauss Center uh, and the Brumley Program for the invitation to uh, talk with you today. I'm just gonna share my screen here. Um, So um, I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about um, how I see political regime dynamics, if you want to call them that, playing out in Russia and the post-Soviet world, which basically means um, focusing on um, patterns of democracy, the lack thereof, 
um, authoritarianism, uh, when these systems break down, and how we can understand uh, the politics there, um, which I think uh, will also have important implications for how we understand what Russia does in international relations, uh, not just uh, what the Kremlin or Putin does in his uh, domestic politics. Um, so I'll start out by just giving you the, the puzzle that I, I see of post-Soviet politics generally, which is um, summarized by the great diversity of regime types in this part of the world. And when I talk about Eurasia, I'm following a, a usage that basically refers to the post-Soviet countries as Eurasia, although there are other ways of thinking about Eurasia that include um, you know, everything from Europe to Asia. Um, but um, what's interesting is coming out of a single political uh, regime, the Soviet Union, um, you see everything from uh, the Baltic countries, which uh, are now embedded in the European Union, fairly stably democratic, to Turkmenistan, um, where at least for a long time, you know, you actually, you literally had a golden statue of the dictator rotating to face the sun. Um, and then you have lots of other regimes that are sort of in between, um, you know, some like Russia closer to the, um, uh, you know, kind of, you know, very authoritarian end, uh, others like Ukraine, a little closer to the, the democratic end, but none of them really fitting kind of pure types of uh, autocracy or uh, democracy. Um, and thinking back to how we as observers of the Soviet Union and then Russia and Ukraine and these other countries have thought about these regimes, um, it seems to me that we've been on something like a roller coaster ride of expectations regarding where these countries are headed. Um, after 1991, uh, people were even talking about uh, concepts like the end of history. Uh, liberalism has won. Um, it's just a matter of time before these countries consolidate uh, democracy. Um, but then it wasn't too long after that that people started to think, well, wait a minute, things aren't really heading in that direction very well. A lot of the countries are, are almost as authoritarian again as the Soviet Union used to be, some of them getting more uh, autocratic. Certainly with the rise of Putin, that became the dominant trend. Um, then you um, had a series of revolutions in these places that seemed to be inspired by democracy. The, the uh, Rose Revolution in Georgia, uh, the Orange Revolution in Ukraine, um, the Tulip Revolution in Kyrgyzstan, all of which then got people talking about, well, okay, there's a new march towards democracy and these authoritarian regimes of the region are, are losing. And um, you know, now we're back in the moving in the direction of democracy, at least generally. But then, you know, the 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 those regimes, those uh, post-revolutionary systems did not fare so well. Um, almost all of them went back uh, at least some degree towards a more authoritarian system. Um, and so it seems like we've been much better at kind of uh, explaining things that have happened in the past than at anticipating what's gonna happen in the future. Of course, that's not surprising generally, but we want to uh, see if we can move a little bit further away from chasing trends to explaining them um, and anticipating developments um, in a way that uh, you know can can account for more than just what we're looking at at a particular given period of time, and, and try to get a big picture of what's going on uh, in that part of the world. So, um, just to preview the basic argument that I will um, present, and then uh, invite your comments and, and questions about, is that to understand what's going on in this part of the world, we have to understand its uh, it, its kind of socio-cultural context. Uh, which I've called patronalism, and I will um, talk about what that is in a moment. Um, and the argument is that given this context, there's a strong tendency for regime dynamics to be cyclical, to kind of move back and forth towards and away from democracy. These cycles can be kind of irregular and irregular, meaning that sometimes countries can kind of be in one phase of a cycle for quite a long time, um, but there still is likely to be a tendency for a, uh, a kind of reverse movement. Um, but then since 1991, the trend has actually been towards more and more predictability in where these regimes are going. Um, so, uh, and then I'll conclude with some implications for how we uh, might understand uh, major countries like uh, Russia and Ukraine, kind of where they're headed and, and how they might be expected to behave uh, in both domestic politics and international politics. Um, so what do I mean by patronalism? Um, 
So uh, for lack of a better word, uh, so I, I kind of took this word and, and infused it with this meaning. Um, you know, what I'm really talking about is uh, a society where um, connections matter and not just a society where connections matter for politics, like a little bit, right? Like I'm in Washington, DC. We all know connections matter, kind of who you know, but societies where um, they are almost all determining. Um, so patronalism is a social equilibrium, meaning that it's self-reinforcing uh, in which the pursuit of political or economic ends so the way that people um, you know, go about achieving things in politics or economics uh, tends to be organized primarily through personalized rewards and punishments meted out to specific individuals through networks of actual acquaintance. And so this is basically the idea that you are working to get something done like organizing a political party or movement or to change a policy. Um, you don't just organize with like-minded individuals. Um, more likely than not, you will organize with individuals that you know or have some connection with. You know, maybe it's not your own friend or your own relative, but it's a friend of your friend or a relative of your friend or a friend of your relative, and and so on and so on and so on, uh, because these connections are um, really important for knowing who you can trust. Um, and so, you know, there's an argument to be made that this is a natural way for people to get things done in government. Um, you know, the earliest human societies were very small. Um, and so, of course, you're going to know everybody in that society. So it makes sense to work through the personal relationships that you have. It's only once society got very large and you started to have like communities that were much bigger, uh, you know, that it was possible for uh, everyone to know each other in that the idea of kind of working through sort of impersonal rules, uh, you know, would 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 emerge, um, but in fact, I think you can make the argument that it's actually unusual in the world practice for institutions to work independently of personal connections. Um, you know, and even as we know in the United States or uh, you know other countries that we think about as being very rule of law based. Um, you know, it wasn't that long in our histories where, you know, we, uh, you know, where those systems of rule of law were sort of questionable or could be broken down easily by corrupt practices or who, who you know. Um, and even that is sort of a, a relatively recent um, practice. Um, and so what I, the point that I want to make here is that patronalism is a kind of vicious cycle. And that's what I mean kind of by an equilibrium. It's being self-reinforcing um, in that most of the people well, you know, people generally oppose the idea of it in the abstract, right? So the idea of kind of having to pull a connection, right? Call in a connection to get something like a job uh, or uh, a good that's, uh, you know, scarce. Um, you know, people don't like that idea. You don't like the idea that, well, you know, why should the, uh, you know, relatives of the doctor get an appointment sooner than I get an appointment, even though my medical need is more acute, right? People don't like that idea. But at the same time, people also take advantage of it when it benefits them or when they think it's necessary. And they're arguably more likely to take advantage of it and use these practices if they think that other people are doing so. So if you think this is how things are done, right? That's, you know, you don't like it, but this is how things work in my country. Um, it becomes more acceptable to say, okay, well, you know, in, in an ideal world, I wouldn't do this, but, you know, I have no other choice. I need to get you know, this appointment for my son, or I need to, you know, I need this uh, kind of rare or scarce good for, you know, some purpose. Um, you know, I really need a job or my, my brother needs a job. Um, so I'm going to uh, pull on these connections to see if I can get them something. Um, and so in this sense, um, what you do in deciding whether or not to kind of pull your connections, right, to draw on your connections to get something done depends on what you expect other people to do. So if you expect a lot of other people to be doing this, it becomes more acceptable for you to be doing it. Um, and when everybody expects everyone else to do it, it can become extremely hard to root out because to root it out, you need to convince people not only that you shouldn't do it, that it's a bad thing, but that other people aren't doing it either. Um, so what are some of the rough correlates of patronalism? You know, these are more familiar concepts like uh, high levels of corruption, low rule of law, 
Um, you know, there are other kind of political science terms that some of you might recognize, low social capital, clientelism, that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, I want to make clear that uh, patronalism is not the same as corruption. Um, you know, a lot of people would characterize lobbying in the United States as corrupt, even though it's, it's not corrupt in the sense of violating um, uh, law, right, because it's legal. Um, so there, there is a distinction here, but it's simply the idea of kind of working through connections. Um, you know, and the other, uh, other thing I'd mention is there can also be a certain morality to working through connections, right? Because if you are a, uh, say, a legislator that needs to get something done that's vital for your community that you represent, say, like, you know, getting a medical center built in your community, um, and you refuse to draw on your personal connections, um, and if that means that everybody else who is drawing on their personal connections are going to get the things that your community needs, then there's an argument that a lot of people in your community are going to make that you are ineffective. You are not able to serve us and represent us given what everybody else does, given just the way things are. Um, and so in that case, you can make an argument that the uh, legislature who um, engages in such practices uh, you know, would be doing so by necessity. That they, you know, think that well, you know, this is not the ideal world. This is the least of the evil uh, options that are uh, available to me. Um, so we can see kind of certain uh, patterns in, in the post-Soviet world where, um, you know, uh, uh, levels of patronalism are higher. Um, and so, you know, I already mentioned kind of the the Baltic countries, um, you know, that are in the middle uh, category of moderately patronalistic. Um, the least paternalistic would be in the post-communist world, certain um, East European countries, you know, Croatia, Czech Republic, East Germany, um, you know, but you can see among the more paternalistic countries um, would be, you know, countries ranging from, you know, alphabetically Albania, you know, down to Georgia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, to Russia and Ukraine, um, most of the post-Soviet space. Um, and, you know, these are categorizations uh, based on a related concept, not the same thing, but basically I think they kind of, you know, fit. Just to give you an idea of where patronalism, uh, I think, is kind of in, in strong form there, and therefore likely, you know, it's, it's important for us to understand how it works in order to stand, understand its politics. So what are some of the implications for politics? And so I'm going to talk in the abstract a little bit before then talking about how a lot of this applies to former Soviet uh, patterns, including in Russia and Ukraine. So one implication is that the most important collective political actors in these societies tend to be extended networks of actual personal acquaintance. So that means they are not um, institutions that we usually think of in the United States as being the main actors in politics, like parties, uh, parliament, or, or you know, Congress, um, the government, the state. Uh, or even firms, or even individuals. Instead, these are actual networks that tend to be relatively hierarchical, where you have one person at the top um, that may be considered a patron, um, that then um, kind of actually have their own representatives in all of these other formal institutions. So the more powerful networks in places like Russia will have representatives in multiple political parties, often completely different ideologies. So some might have a representative or be donating money at the same time to the Communist Party and to a pro-democracy party. Um, they might also have representatives in parliament, uh, in the executive branch, have firms or economic enterprises under their control, right? So they, they operate across these formal institutions and they can mobilize all of these different resources uh, in battle against other networks that have similar structures but just have somewhat different interests. Um, and they tend to be roughly hierarchical, as I said before, kind of extending from the top to the bottom. Um, so if we look at the post-Soviet space, um, what kind of networks are there? Well, first of all, they're networks that often get called in the media um, oligarchs, right? These are typically uh, uh, networks where the, the, the people at the top, the chief patrons, are some of the richest business people in the world. Um, and so, but these business people are more than just business people, right? They're more than their formal title of, uh, you know, CEO of Alpha Group, for example, or, you know, Gunvor, 
or you know, to give some examples of corporations in Russia, right? Instead, what they are is they're not only the head of this corporation, but they also have all these networks of all kinds of personal, um, uh, you know, people who basically owe them something or who can be called on to help out um, that penetrate all these different other organizations, including parties, uh, you know, parliament, um, you know, regional governments, and, and so on. Regional political machines are also another uh, form of network, basically local interests uh, where you have a local, um, you know, strong man, woman, warlord type person that dominates a local territory, kind of all the, uh, you know, assets, economic, political, um, nonprofit, so to speak, uh, you know, in a given region. Um, that's another type of network. Um, you know, in some parts of the former Soviet space, there's talk of like clans, um, you know, they don't really boil down to just kinship, but kinship uh, family ties could be part of that. Um, and also networks that kind of grow out of the state. So just to give you a, a example, um, and so this is an example from the 1990s, which is useful primarily because you can really document um, what it, uh, you know, basically, you know, all these different ties and the types of people that are in it, um, which are often uh, kind of difficult to actually tease out. So if we look at Moscow Mayor uh, Yuri Lushkov's political network from 1998 to 1999, um, we see his power was not simply being mayor of Moscow and therefore having the powers that were um, ascribed to him in the city charter. Instead, the power that he had to influence national politics grew on a whole array of different personal connections. So um, for one thing, uh, um, he had uh, strong alliances with big businesses that had made a lot of money by um, working with him in the Moscow mayor office at Moscow's mayor office, and also um, sometimes with relationships dating before he became mayor. Um, so the uh, most network, uh, media most and everything is included media and had lots of business holdings across Russia. His wife, uh, 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 you know, Baturina was one of the richest women in Russia. Um, and she had a, a whole construction uh, enterprise that she ran that had businesses all across Russia. Um, so she had business partners, employees, clients, um, lots of other businesses that were in relationship with Luzkov. Um, other, uh, you know, of course, he did also have the people within the Moscow city administration, which had all kinds of economic interests, owned shares in a lot of the um, uh, businesses doing business in Russia, um, controlled media. Uh, there was a, a, a nationwide television network that was largely owned and controlled by the Moscow city government. Um, there were people that Luzhkov or his associates um, went to school with or had deep longstanding friendships with that um, um, also had major assets. And so basically there were all kinds of um, uh, different people that could be drawn on to use their assets, their money, their wealth, their power to help Luzhkov when he called on them to do so. And so these were people that were actually mobilized when he decided to run for president um, in uh, 1988, 1999. And ultimately he was defeated by Putin, uh, but then co-opted by Putin who then basically took over uh, to a large extent his network. Um, so this is just by way of an example. Um, so let me get on to a couple other implications here. So networks like Luzhkov's and many, many others find that they need direct and personal access to power in order to survive and thrive, to make their money, to exercise their power. And this is largely because they can't rely on courts or the rule of law to protect them if they lose power. So if they fall into uh, you know, opposition against the person who is dominant, then they risk losing everything. And so what they try to do is um, basically, the second thing mentioned here is to be on the winning side whenever there's a struggle for power at the top. And so what we saw Luzhkov do was initially he was running for power, but then at a certain point, you know, he wanted to be president in 1999, which is when Putin was trying to become president. But at a certain point, it became clear that Putin was gonna win. And at that point, you saw Luzhkov basically uh, take his pedal off the gas and, and start trying to um, make amends with Putin and to support him. And that's one reason why Putin, in the end, won the presidential election with a big margin. 
was because the, 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 the people who had opposed him had already given up once they had seen that Putin was the stronger political candidate. And so um, they and these people like Luzhkov realized that they didn't want to lose their uh, assets. Instead, they thought they'd be better off by aligning with Putin. And so this helped them survive politically uh, for a lot longer. So in the end, you know, Luzhkov wound up uh, an integral part of Putin's political system until 2010, when he was finally uh, removed. And at that point, basically, uh, you know, he suffered the political consequences of what he had done. But he bought himself another 10 years by um, by by trying to get himself on the winning side. You know, regardless of all of the reasons that he had given earlier to be against uh, the, the Russian authorities and the people that had backed, uh, you know, Putin's rise to power. And so, you know, the key is if you you stand a risk of losing everything, if you're on the losing side, it becomes more important to be on the winning side than to stand up for what you actually believe in. So it doesn't mean you don't actually have any beliefs, but it just means that you're much more likely to um, kind of push those aside for the purposes of not falling into uh, disfavor with the authorities. Um, and so uh, there's a, a big push to, um, you know, basically kind of figure out who is going to win and then get on their side. And the final couple implications that I'll mention is, uh, are, um, first of all, because each network has resources that can influence who wins a power struggle, um, the side that ultimately wins any struggle for power depends on which side all of these networks together support, right? So, you know, say you have 10 very powerful networks in Russia, each one might have a 10th of the power to decide who is gonna be the next uh, president of Russia or who is gonna be able to continue to be the president of Russia. Um, so if six of them get together and say, okay, well, we're gonna support candidate X, um, that's great. But for each network individually, um, you know, one of them could say, okay, well, I don't want to be one of the six because I don't like this candidate. I want to gang up with the other four and push another candidate. So then that'll create a deadlock. And then all they have to do is bring one more candidate over or one more network over to tip the balance. And so effectively what this means is that there's a key politics of coordination among these networks because the power of the patron, right, uh, is vulnerable to all of these different power networks. But Every power net, you know, each power network acting individually is not strong enough to make the decision, but together they can. And so the key is how do these networks decide on whose authority to recognize and whose authority to back? Um, because which side you back depends on what side you think the others are backing, but what side the others are backing depends in part on what side they think you are backing. So that's what a lot of politics in this part of the world, I think, is about, is figuring out where power, not just where power lies now, but where it's likely to lie in the future and what other people are going to think about where it's likely to lie in the future, and then getting on that side or influencing where those expectations lie. So um, one proposition that I, uh, I, I put forth here is that in a situation like this, having a constitution that posits a single president as the most powerful actor in a country is going to tend to lead all of these networks to coordinate their authority around that single patron. And so basically, if you imagine a simple patronalistic world where you have lots of these different networks, a bunch of oligarchs, regional political machines, and no constitution, um, they're all kind of competing for power, uh, being careful to try to figure out who's going to be the most powerful. So they're looking for signs of how powerful all the others are. Um, and there's no prior constitution. Um, if you introduce a presidentialist constitution on top of that, then effectively what this is doing is creating an indivisible good, meaning the office of the presidency, that symbolizes superior strength right? But that only one network can hold. So by introducing a constitution that says there is a post to the president, this person is the most powerful. Um, well, this is going to have a couple effects because whoever gets that presidency 
is going to be more likely to be seen by others as the more powerful just by virtue of having had enough power to get the presidency. And then this in turn will make other networks more likely to see you as the more dominant person and therefore to act in your interests um, or at least not contradict your interests. Um, and the presidency could also basically make its occupant, as I mentioned here, a focal point for anyone who's uncertain. So right, say you don't know, okay, well, there are these two networks in the country, they're both powerful, but I don't really know which one is more powerful. Well, one of them has this title of president and the other doesn't. So maybe I'll just go over to the president because I think maybe that's just the, the better option here. And so kind of what this is saying is that um, the constitution and having a presidency can influence how these networks behave, even if these networks don't care at all about the rule of law. All they care about is who holds the symbolism of power. And that is going to lead them to coordinate around that person. And so what you would lead this, what this would lead you to expect is that, like we go back to these representations of the networks, um, that the people in the non-presidential network are going to be more likely to start recognizing the network that has a control of the presidency. And so you're going to get a situation where a lot of different networks are now kind of arranging themselves around the one that has the presidency and marginalizing anyone who doesn't do that. And so this is a situation that I've called the single pyramid system that um, is gonna look quite authoritarian because um, you know who's gonna provide money to opposition politicians if uh, all the people who control the money and the power uh, locally and different businesses are just trying to please the president. So you know even without laws kind of stating that the country is authoritarian, um, you're going to see this consolidation of power around uh, the president. And so I think if we now start thinking about what's happened in the post-Soviet space since the Soviet Union collapsed, um, basically the 1990s is uh, a history uh, of single pyramid systems like this emerging in the former Soviet Union. And so, you know, basically the Soviet Union collapsed. Um, it left all these different um, collections of people together, all kinds of different networks, some of whom were kind of newly created in the transition um, through the opportunities that they saw. Um, others kind of had their roots in the Soviet period. Um, and uh, kind of the old system had disappeared. And what we see is that um, all 12 of the uh, high patronalism post-Soviet states, former Soviet Union states, wound up with uh, presidentialist constitutions um, and all but one of them wound up developing this kind of strong patronal presidentialism, uh, single pyramid systems, uh, through all kinds of political struggles that turned out in the 1990s. And there's only one exception out of these uh, 12 states that where you didn't wind up with a, a, a kind of authoritarian system that uh, was dominated by uh, the president, and that was in Mo Moldova, where um, for a variety of reasons, a parliamentary system basically won out. The parliament won the struggle with the president, and, um, uh, and then it, it took a totally different uh, uh, regime path. Um, oops, sorry. Um, one one um, uh, thing to remember, though, is that even once this, um, you know, the, the uh, president consolidates power, the expectations of a, a leader's departure. So succession struggles basically can be um, uh, uh, you know, a cause of the uh, instability of this system, right? So a president manages to get a hold of the presidency, um, rallies all these other networks in society around it, which then support his or her power and dominance over the rest of society. Um, it would seem like this would be a pretty permanent system. But what we also see is that when people start thinking that, well, maybe there's going to be a succession on the horizon, maybe this leader is going to be on his or her way out, um, the whole system starts to fall apart because the leader effectively becomes a lame duck, right? Um, so networks in the system, when they think the leader is going to be on the way out, have to position themselves for a future after the outgoing president. And this means they have to start jockeying now to identify who's going to be this person, who the likeliest winner is. And where possible, they might want to become the winner 
or at least make sure their rival is not the winner, right? To influence who becomes the winner. And this kind of competition, which then reduces the authority of the sitting president can start to break apart the single pyramid system. And so a typical result can be um, what happens is a, a, a revolutionary process whereby um, the regime breaks apart. You get open competition now among these networks. They start competing for public opinion as a way of influencing the outcomes of these struggles. But it's not really democratization, even though the people that have support often wind up being the winners. Um, and you know the, the people who have public support in these struggles often win because they can get the most people in the streets. Um, and a lot of times these other networks kind of look and say, okay, well, in case the election is free or fair, um, you know, the people that have more support at a minimum have an advantage. And if it's not, not gonna be free and fair, the people who have more support aren't gonna have to engage in as much pressure to falsify results, um, engage in all kinds of riskier um, activity. But the problem is that after the struggle is resolved, you get this whole dynamic uh, uh, taking place again, whereby the networks coordinate again um, around a new uh, president. And you get basically a new single pyramid system uh, emerging. And so we see that basically after the original single pyramid system formed in every political system in the post-Soviet space, um, regime cycles have become pretty regular. Um, and so if we look at the, I mean, again, depending on how you count them, um, basically nine patronal presidents uh, networks have been ousted in various kinds of revolutions or palace coups in the former Soviet space uh, since the 1990s, uh, you know, since the, the first single pyramid systems were introduced. Um, and eight of these nine were overthrown when they uh, encountered a situation where they were unpopular and you know, so we're not able to keep up public support and we're essentially lame ducks for one of the following reasons. Either they had reached term limits, which they had not removed from the books. Um, so you can see a lot of the leaders here, you know, Bakiev, um, Akayev in Kyrgyzstan, Lev uh, Terpetrosyan in Armenia, Shevardnadze in Georgia, Saakashvili in Georgia, um, then more recently, uh, Sargsyan in Armenia, they all ran up against term limits. Um, Leonid Kuchma in Ukraine did not run, and Shevardnadze also had the issue that he was kind of over 70, which tends to uh, raise expectations about succession. Um, the big exception here was Ukraine in 2014, where Yanukovych was not up against term limits. Um, he was unpopular, but he didn't combine the term limits with lack of popularity. And we also see cases where there were uh, certain lame duck presidents who um, fell into political competition, but were still popular in support. And so these leaders managed to still win the uh, succession struggles. And so this is where Vladimir Putin uh, comes in. And uh, we see Haydar Aliyev and Ilham Aliyev in Azerbaijan. And um, again, you know, leaders of Armenia uh, without going into all the details. Um, but in all of these cases, basically, you know, even after revolutions like the Orange Revolution that were considered democratic breakthroughs, you saw a new round of political closure um, except under one uh, important condition. And that is, um, oops, sorry, here I got my, um, I got my uh, slides mixed up here. Uh, and, the, and the condition basically is that um, you had a constitutional change. And so um, the revolutions that kind of had a much more lasting democratic experience were the countries where the constitution switched with the revolution from a presidentialist system to one that had more of a system of checks and balances, what I've called the divided executive constitution, where basically you have a division of power wherein you have a prime minister that is primarily selected by parliament through parliamentary elections and a directly elected president. So basically they can check each other and prevent each other from uh, consolidating power. Um, I'm gonna kind of skip the the kind of logic behind this. I think it's basically intuitive here. But what we see is that then the, the countries that wound up with divided executive constitutions, those more checks and balances in the former Soviet space, have all wound up being much more open and democratic and competitive than the ones that have some form of presidentialism. 
So um, this is Ukraine, uh, Georgia, uh, Ukraine again, it had a period where it had a presidential constitution, um, Moldova today and, and Kyrgyzstan up until maybe this spring when it looks like it's gonna go back to a presidentialist constitution. Um, you can also point to some other post-communist cases in the, in the greater post-communist region. Um, and all these countries have been substantially more open. Um, and, um, you know, whereas un, under, un, un, uh, in, yeah, so un, unlike presidentialism, uh, you know, they've managed to sustain their uh, political activity. So Ukraine can be seen as a kind of classic patronal democracy in this regard. So it has a, a, a divided executive constitution, um, which it had between 2005 and 2010, and then again after the Euromaidan revolution in 2014. Um, and basically during these periods, the, the main networks have failed to dominate. And so um, when I say two networks failed to dominate, I'm referring to the current period. So you have pictured here uh, Poroshenko, the previous president, and Zelensky, the current president. Um, both of whom represented major political networks, uh, including Poroshenko was himself an oligarch uh, who had all kinds of representation and political power outside the presidency to potentially draw on. And Zelensky was, was widely interpreted as, um, as uh, you know, being backed by um, uh, another oligarch in Ukraine, uh, Ihor Kolomoisky, who was a big rival to Poroshenko. Um, and so both of these presidents had strong network ties that came to dominance. Um, and at least, you know, Zelensky hasn't been in power for too long. Poroshenko was there for uh, five years. And it's clear he tried to consolidate his control over uh, the Ukrainian political system, but was simply unable to do it because the constitution doesn't really provide the same incentives for all of these diverse networks in Ukraine to coordinate its authority, to coordinate their authority around those of uh, Poroshenko. And so the result is that you get basically a form of democracy, but one that's very, uh, you might call it corrupt and weak. It's kind of like a competition among different political machines. Uh, so there's very little fraud, right? Very little outright falsification of vote results. But what there is, is a lot of corruption in the political system, uh, lots of payoffs, um, media stories being planted, um, you know, rumors of, of vote buying, uh, you know, which, uh, you know, I think probably are credible in a lot of circumstances, um, you know, politicians uh, kind of unduly influencing each other or, uh, you know, trying to tip the scales electorally using kind of corrupt means. Um, but there's still competition. There's still relatively uh, strong opportunities for opposition to mobilize and, and actually win. So we saw that Zelensky actually defeated Poroshenko uh, in the 2019 presidential uh, elections. And now Zelensky, even though he's leading the presidential race, um, you know, he's far from dominant. And uh, so we see just a much more fluid kind of political system there. Um, whereas in Russia, um, it's much more um, of a, a good example of a, uh, of a single pyramid system. Uh, which I think gives it this aura of being a stably authoritarian country. Um, and so how has this managed to um, be the case in Russia? Um, in the 1990s, Russia looked a lot like Ukraine and even the early Putin era. So how did we get there in Russia? Well, I already talked about the, the process through which presidential constitution um, helped consolidate networks coordination around uh, the single patron. In this case, the patron is Putin. Um, so in this sense, the system is, uh, you know, I think the, the system is, is not really adequately called Putinism because it exists in lots of other places. And Putin certainly did not invent this system of rule. Um, it existed in other places like Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan long before Putin came in place. And even if you look at kind of some of the politics in Russia's regions, something like this existed in Russia long before Putin entered the political scene uh, in 1999 and 2000. But what Putin has done and what I think is fairly distinctive about him as a chief patron is that he has been very, very good at doing the things that require keeping this kind of system stable and functioning, which is first of all, to find ways to sustain popular support or at a minimum, the belief that he's popular. 
Um, I mean, I think there's good reason to believe he actually is popular. It doesn't mean he would be popular if there were a lot of, uh, uh, you know, free media criticism of him uh, available, but he maintains this popular support through control over the media um, by actually paying attention to some kinds of policies and outputs. So they have an interest in promoting economic growth to some degree. Um, the government does a lot of things that it thinks people will like and avoids a lot of things that don't, it doesn't think they'll like. Um, and also generating rally around the flag effects. And I think this is where actions like, uh, you know, the um, uh, you know, invasion of, of Crimea come in. I don't think it was only about domestic politics, but at least it had this effect of boosting his popular support. Putin has also most recently um, in the 2020 constitutional reform eliminated term limits that were also potentially, um, you know, creating succession problems in Russia. And he also dis uh, displays a great deal of skill in arranging all the complex networks in his system. So finding places for the old Yeltsin era networks, like the old ones like, like uh, you know, Lushkov's group and the Alpha group. I mean, Lushkov's group basically found them a place until he decided he finally wanted to kind of push them out 10 years later. Um, new networks that have arisen uh, in the Putin era, basically among his childhood friends or people that he knew from earlier stages in life who became massively wealthy and uh, connected in politics, um, and also his own family. Right, so it's very interesting that Putin has paid great attention to keeping his family out of politics because I think actually um, one's relatives can become a, a, a political liability uh, in systems like this. Um, you know, I mean, there are a few exceptions where people have made it work, uh, like in Azerbaijan, but for the most part, it's been a problem. Um, but one thing that Russia can't control, which I think is weakening this system, uh, what I mean, the Kremlin can't control is the health of the age of the leader, because once the leader starts getting older, less firm, um, succession rumors are going to start, right? You know, rumors are going to start. Why wasn't he seen in public the last three days? Oh, you know, maybe he has this disease. Oh my God, he might have a disease. Um, you know, maybe it's fatal. Uh, you know, and these kind of things can create, you know, big tensions in the, in the system. So just to conclude with some possible implications for the future, um, I think for Russia, I think one implication is Russia is less stable than it's often thought, uh, at least the current political system. Um, and the key, I think, is, is Putin's health, which means that, you know, as Putin ages, every successive election is likely to be more and more dangerous for the Kremlin's ability to uh, um, stay, you know, keep, keep the reins of power. Um, and this is going to give Putin um, increasingly intense incentive to try and find ways to reconnect with the population, which is a big challenge because Russia's growth has been fairly uh, anemic in recent times. And, uh, you know, the COVID crisis has certainly been a big problem in that regard. And I think this is one reason why we might expect some more surprises in Russian foreign policy, just moves that might gin up public support for him. Um, in the meantime, without these kind of new injections of popular uh, support that they would try to provide. Uh, you know, we see the Kremlin increasingly relying on authoritarian methods, uh, you know, crackdowns, jailing political opponents in ways they really haven't done before, or at least on a scale that they haven't done before. Um, Ukraine, on the other hand, actually, I think has some promise. I mean, the biggest challenge, of course, is the war with Russia, which I think sets off domestically some very negative dynamics that, that hinder democratization. But it's interesting to me, kind of looking at what's been going on in Ukraine, that Zelensky seems to be actually showing evidence that he might be actually going after his own patron, uh, Kolomoisky, which I've always seen as a um, uh, idea that he may, um, you know, as kind of a sign, right, that, uh, you know, if he really wants to democratize, he's going to be going out, he has to go after people who um, supported him, not just his political opponents. And so this may be the case. But one of the big problems with a system like this, and this will be my final remark, is that unfortunately, because patronal democracy tends to be kind of corrupt competition, people often don't like it because they don't see it as real competition. They don't like the corruption in it. And a lot of times, ironically, this can lead people to say, well, actually, I don't like this corrupt competition. I actually would prefer um, kind of a, 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 a strong man or strong woman type of system where we have a presidentialist system and we have order. I mean, the irony is, of course, that those systems are incredibly corrupt too. It's just you don't hear about, as much, about it as much in media and they seem more stable 
uh, on the outside, but at the same time, they're more uh, present towards revolution. So um, I think uh, they're dangers for Ukraine as well. But let me leave it there. I've talked a little bit longer than I anticipated, but hopefully we'll have time for some uh, questions and, and comments. I'd love to hear your reactions. Uh, you know, these are events I continue to uh, follow and, and think about actively. So thank you again for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Hale. That was um, fantastic. Um, I guess I'll kick off with the first question, but I encourage uh, all of our viewers and listeners to please uh, write your questions um, in, the, in the comment uh, with the comment function, question function that you see um, at the bottom of your, your Zoom screen. Uh, I think my question is about um, democracy promotion and, and assistance, right? So since the fall of the Soviet Union and going much farther back, the US and the EU and other European countries have had these programs to promote democracy in other countries. You know, we, we think of USAID and National Endowment for Democracy. And it, it, these, these, these measures span things from, you know, uh, training teachers or uh, exchange programs to bring people to uh, the West to see how democracy functions. It could be, it, it's, it's things like supporting entrepreneurs, businessmen. There's been a real scattershot of measures um, that have tried to been, be used to, pro, to promote democracy. And so I was wondering, has there, what specific measures have been shown to directly attack this patronal system, which you called a socio-cultural kind of phenomenon almost? Is there anything that really attacks that patronalism at its heart in terms of democracy uh, assistance that you know of or has talked about? The big problem with uh, kind of reforming, you know, uh, patronal systems, right, and kind of, you know, attacking the, the root cause of a lot of these problems. I mean, I, I think, well, first of all, let me just say, I think there are kind of two issues, right? It's not so much that paternalism itself is antithetical to democracy. You can have a certain form of democracy with it, but what makes it more authoritarian um, is the addition of a presidentialist system. And pretty much, uh, you know, democracy pro uh, promotion programs are not going to be able to kind of change the constitution. Um, you know, although what I would say is that I think, you know, democracy promotion programs are most useful when they're just about the exchange of ideas, right? Helping people learn about other people's systems, understand, you know, kind of get ideas about, uh, you know, how political systems, uh, you know, could work in different contexts. Not so much for taking lessons back for their own system. I think like lessons drawn from how American politics works, um, uh, you know, my, my understanding of kind of, you know, and talking to a lot of Russian politicians, including people that were working as election strategists were that, well, the systems are just totally different. You know, the things that we were kind of taught as lessons there on these programs, uh, you know, just don't apply. But they all come away kind of, it's interesting to see how a different system can work. And so, you know, maybe in kind of a longer term perspective, um, you know, it can, it can alter expectations and alter, um, you know, views about, okay, well, maybe, uh, you know, Russia might not have to be a presidential system, uh, you know, like its history would suggest it might you know, need to be and like everybody's telling us it can be and, you know, student exchanges and everything like that can I think kind of help, uh, you know, over the long run, foster greater ideas about what might be possible, rather than kind of particular lessons. Um, and so I think that's the other problem with kind of, uh, you know, sort of, um, you know, patronalism is that like, uh, you know, you often have people who come to these programs and see, wow, you know, look, how great the system works, like when you have the rule of law and you have systems of courts that can enforce it. Uh, and then they come back to their own countries and realize something very different. And so, you know, unfortunately, I think that's something often that a lot of students from different countries find is they, they come like to the United States or others. And, uh, you know, we have our own imperfections too, uh, you know, to be sure. Um, but, you know, maybe they see and say, okay, well, I wish our system worked a little bit more like this. I'm going to try that. But then they go back to their own system and they find out, well, you know, some of these practices that people engage in in our home politics are really necessary for getting something done. So they wind up having to kind of, you know, compromise their ideals. And I think that's the problem is the, you know, the problem is the system, in order to change the system, you have to change not only people's own views, you know, you might even kind of be able to change everybody's view. But what you need to do is, uh, beyond that is to convince everybody that everybody else's views have also changed and that everybody else's behavior is also going to change. And that's the key. And that's very difficult to do through these kind of inter incremental programs. I mean, I think what they may do is like at best kind of, which I think is a, a, a good thing is kind of, you know, maybe lay some ideational groundwork, right? You know, for how people think about how things maybe should be, 
that then given the opportunity, you know, maybe one day they could make that change. Um, but I, I don't think we can see a whole lot of change, you know, of any anything kind of immediate, um, you know, with some small exceptions, I guess. Uh, you know, I could talk more about this, but I, I want to leave time for other uh, questions. Sure, certainly. Um, Patrick Herndon asks a good question. He basically asks, well, how, how do uh, the kind of military and security services, the secret police in, in Russia, the FSB, the other uh, intelligence agencies, how do the so-called Silviki fit into this p uh, patronal system? Are they their own kind of vertical uh, branch, if you will, or is it something more complicated uh, than that? Or kind of how do they fit into this system? Yeah, that's, that's a very important uh, uh, question uh, and, and topic. Um, and I think, um, you know, the answer is that they are part of the system, but not a unified part. Because basically the people that we call Siliviki um, actually tend to represent a lot of different networks of their own. Um, and a lot of them um, either interpenetrate other types of networks, right? Um, you know, businesses will have, you know, some business groups will have ties with some Siliviki, um, other Siliviki will have ties with other business groups or other parts of the state. Um, and so you have a lot of, you know, so I think it's a, it's a mistake to think that, well, you know, the uh, kind of, you know, Siliviki, like the KGB is a former network, right? Because there, there are plenty of people that um, have backgrounds in the, in, the, in the former KGB who are kind of bitter uh, political rivals. Um, my colleague at GW, my, my predecessor at GW, I actually have his position before he retired, Peter Redaway, wrote a really interesting book in 2018 um, on basically the bitter wars that were kind of, uh, you know, fought partly in public, I mean, wars figuratively, um, between different factions in the, these kind of force agencies, um, you know, especially during 2008, when a lot of people were worried within this group that uh, Putin was actually going to hand off power to Medvedev, like at that time, it wasn't clear. And so there were a lot, you know, some groups of Silibiki were very opposed to that. They saw Putin as their main protector, whereas others struck up alliances with Medvedev and thought, okay, well, we can work with this guy. Um, and so, you know, the divisions kind of cut across all of these formal institutions that we typically um, uh, think of. But, you know, certainly the ones that wield actual coercive power are very important players here, but they're not unified um, and I think actually that's part of Putin's strategy has been to keep them divided, right? He's been very cautious, like not to completely um, unify them, uh, you know, at least, uh, you know, or, or to make sure he plays on some of those differences to make sure, you know, they don't become a threat to him. Right. Um, I, we've got a really good question here about uh, Navalny, who obviously gets so much um, attention here in the West. Um, the, the question is, does he pose a threat specifically that to this patronal structure in any way? Is there anything about his messaging ideology that is kind of bringing uh, the spotlight to patronalism as kind of the defining feature here? Yeah, I mean, that, that's another, right, a great question. Uh, yeah, it's based on some good insight, I think. Um, yeah, I think Navalny is interesting because despite everything in the system that really is designed to, uh, you know, keep you know, basically uh, 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 keep down opponents and, and prevent opportunities for opponents to win political support. Navalny seems to have uh, the potential to kind of win broad support in the system. Um, you know, and I think partly it grows, you know, I think it grows out of two things. Um, you know, one is not intrinsically related to the system, which I think is, uh, you know, he's kind of managed to develop a combination of you know, patriotism slash nationalism slash liberalism, right? So he's kind of a liberal, but he's not like a clearly pro-Western liberal, right? And a lot of his views that he's been associated with, you know, kind of the anti-migrant sentiment um, are extremely popular in Russia. Um, he's downplayed those, uh, you know, to some degree because, you know, they're, they're pretty controversial, but all of that gives him the potential to have a pretty strong broad base in Russia. And he's got credibility on anti-corruption um, you know, because of his work. And I think that's exactly what he's been trying to do is expose the way that this patronal system of power works in Russia by um, cleverly using the internet and in all kinds of ways to um, expose the corruption in the system, you know, because like people participate in the system, but they don't like the corruption in it. They also tend to think that, well, um, 
you know, it's inevitable, right? This is just the way the system works. And that's the big problem the Valley faces is, uh, you know, they, they, first of all, they question, okay, well, if he came to power, how different would he really be? Um, you know, maybe you could convince them that, but then, you know, the thing is, if, if not enough people are willing to kind of break with the current system in order to support him and don't think that many other people are, then, um, you know, he may not have a chance. Um, but I guess like what I would say is that, you know, if there is something to shake at the top, right? Like, you know, I mean, say something happens to Putin and, you know, his health deteriorates rapidly or, um, you know, even maybe if he decides not to run for president in 2024, right? Kind of, we consider that unlikely, but you can't rule that out. And then maybe something happens that the person he chooses as successor, you know, turns out to be a dud. Um, you know, somebody like Navalny is probably pretty well positioned to, you know, be someone who can actually rally enough public support to be seen as credible by other networks, you know, including oligarchs, um, maybe even some parts of the of the Siliviki, uh, you know, who would see him as a potential um, credible rival and want to get on his good side rather than be on his bad side should he win. Um, and uh, you know, there there are rumors that he actually has the tacit support of some of these groups anyway, which would explain why he ha has only recently been arrested despite being you know a major opposition figure um, you know since 2011. I mean, I, I find that uh, kind of a little hard to believe, but. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, that's the way that the thinking within the system, you know, would kind of work. And so I think he is probably uniquely threatening to the Kremlin's rule at this point, you know, because he has popular support uh, in, in the ways that I've said. And, uh, but at the same time, as long as Putin remains reasonably popular and um, has a, uh, is not a lame duck, uh, uh, you know, I see very little chance for, uh, you know, him to, uh, you know, kind of have a chance to come to power anytime soon. Mm -hmm. uh, do, are there any specific, you know, for we have a, a viewer asking, what, what are the books that you would maybe recommend for a gen general audience who wants to kind of go into this, uh, into these issues that you've brought up of patronalism and kind of uh, regional mm -hmm. politics uh, more generally in, into more depth? And that the reader specifically asks, asks about a book called Eastward, Eastward Toward Tartary by Robert Kaplan. I don't know if you've heard of it, but um, do you have any thoughts about that book or other books that you would recommend kind of on this issue? Actually, I haven't read that one. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll have to read it. Um, I mean, there's a, a brand new book that's come out by uh, uh, Timothy Fry at Columbia University uh, called Weak Strongman. I mean, I think, you know, he may kind of push the argument of weakness a little farther than I would. Um, but I think it does get at, uh, you know, some of the issues that, uh, that I've been talking about. Um, Brian Taylor's uh, uh, book uh, in, in 2018, The Code of Putinism, I think is also very good on these issues. Um, and uh, I mean, there, 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 you know, there, there are a few other books that I think, um, uh, you know, I'm only kind of partway through, uh, you know, Gulnaz Sharifadinova has a book that I think is really good on understanding, um, you know, Putinism. Uh, but again, I'm not all the way through that. Um, but at least th those are some of the ones that I would, uh, you know, kind of think about, uh, you know, right, right off the top of my head. Um, but I mean, there's a, lo a long list. I mean, I'd be happy to follow up with anyone if you, you know, want to send me an email and I could, sure. I could you know, try to give a little more thought to that. Well, thank you so much for joining us uh, today. This has been, I think, a really um, enlightening and fascinating uh, conversation that I just think uh, begets kind of further uh, investigation. And so I think that we have a really an interesting time um, coming up uh, for the region, region for when these issues are just going to continue uh, to, to, to be relevant. And I'm looking specifically at Russia's parliamentary elections coming up in September, where we're going to see some of this uh, uh, shuffling where, <laughs> you know, these systems are going to have to uh, make, make certain um, uh, bets on what they think is going to happen as far as Putin's succession in, in, in 2024, possible succession, I should say. Um, uh, with that, I think we can uh, um, uh, wrap it up. Um, all right. Well, thank you very much. I really enjoyed the conversation and uh, look forward to continuing it some other forum in the future. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining us.